Asiatic Society for Social Science Research. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on a very official note, I would like to extend my heartfelt welcome to those who have joined us for this esteemed webinar. And without taking much of the utilized time that we require, let me request Dr. Pramod Kumar Ray, who is the Vice President of ASSSR and Chief Executive of IGPP for the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Milan. <clears throat> a very good evening to each and all. And a warm and graceful morning to our most valued, honorable, distinguished speaker of today's international webinar. His Excellency is the Arun Kumar, Sa Arun Kumar Sahu, Indian High Commissioner to Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to grace all of your presence in the interest of the one of the most topical and uh, having contemporary significance and relevance, contemporary relevance, the topic of today's discussion. It gives me tremendous contentment to welcome you all amongst the esteemed personalities who have own accolades in their respective fields. Uh, I feel it a great deemed a privilege to welcome you all to our first international webinar, which is a long awaited one. And we are organizing the webinar in such a you know, critical time conjecture. The relevance, the utility, significance, and the importance of the topic is not, a, not only having contemporary relevance, but is very pivot to the, you know, discourse of international politics and politics among nations. Fortunately, we are having with us not only a career-based diplomat, having a secure diplomatic career, but more than that, a good researcher with deep academic insights. Uh, friends, they are <clears throat> uh, at the outskirts, I do welcome to all of our, you know, members of AJA, CHA, and all the board directors of the IGPP, Institute of Governance and Public Policy. Before going into detail about, you know, the about our Institute of Governance and Public Policy, I'll just say a few lines on the, the umbrella organization as a Asiatic Society for Social Science Research, of which IGPP is a part of the whole. As a, a umbrella organization is basically a research initiative, mainly engaged in the pursuit of generating new knowledge and analysis in social sciences based on original research, attempting art, catering to the needs of a large number of social scientists, scholars, students, teaching members, and research of different universities, educational institutions, and research institutions across the globe. Besides, we also cater to the needs of the members of a civil society, including journalists, legal professionals, NGO functionaries, policy makers, and law enforcement agencies. Asiatic Society for Social Science Research stands to solve as a mirror to all these conflicting currents of socio-economic, cultural, political, psychological, and other baffling issues that pertains to human life, existence, and in the 21st century since time immemorial. The following centers, branches, divisions are functional under the umbrella, I know, whole of AJA. CHA is the premier a center of specialized studies, Center for History and Archaeology, Center for International Relations Division, Center for Buddhist Studies, Center for Governance and Public Policy is a newly, you know, institutional organized association under this, you know, research institute under the AZA. IGPP, in its 
you know, basic objective and, you know, vision and mission as categorical states. Effective governance and well designed public policy to be prioritized as it helps a nation to grow, prosper, and develop and constitute the sign Q non for realizing its socio economic and political objectives. IGPP, Institute of Governance and Public Policy, is a research endeavor to contribute to people friendly and citizen centric policy making and governance in an increasing complex increasingly complex and challenging world igpp provides an opportunity to all the stakeholders involved in the process of governance and public policy formulation postulation and making a platform of interdisciplinary research to enrich its quality of governance and public policy the vision of IGPP is to provide an interdisciplinary platform for learning and research on governance and public policy too. The Institute will serve as a forum where the academic rigor blends with empirical evidence and the practical experience to promote the knowledge about process of policy making governance at local, regional, national and international level. The core objective of the Institute is to contribute to the design and implementation of public policy by providing relevant policy inputs to the policymakers and planners at the global level. The Institute will serve as a springboard of a pur uh, purposive discourse on effective and qualitative and equitable governance for the developing world viewpoint. The institute, the institute's interaction with informal social institution and civil society organizations is a unique initiative which creates contested roadmap for good governance and effective public policy for all stratum of society in a context of developing countries. The core objective of the institute is to equip the lawmakers, policymakers, you know, research, researchers, academics, and members of civil society with the knowledge and skill sets to address the public policy and governance challenges, challenges of the developing governance, challenges of the developing world. Uh, there are a few objectives which the Institute of Governance and Public Policy designed to work upon to orient the culture of governance and public policy making on the basis of values of ethics, individual morality, righteousness, and truth. It works to reach out the unreached on issues related to pertaining to governance and public policy through research and state of art teaching. To identify areas of issues and relating to governance and public policy and to promote research to strengthen quality governance and public policy. To create networking among, network among scholars, policy makers, policy professionals, peoples engaged in governance for a meaningful dialogue and cooperation. Documenting of research materials in the domain of governance and public policy to make it more effective and equitable. To strengthen learning and training on governance and public policy matters, effective and new pedagogical tools to be developed for the well-being of the society as a whole. To promote debate and discourse on governance and public policy matters, avenues will be created through organizing seminar, symposia, symposium, conferences, and webinars in a blended board. To strengthen research in the field of, field of governance and public policy, through publishing books, newsletters, research papers, etc. Last but not least, the Institute will run academic programs in the field of, uh, to make it more, you know, people friendly and governance and governance centric. And with regard or pertaining to the present 
topic today's topic of discussion and the speaker the distinguished speaker his excellency sri arun kumar sahu ifs indian high commissioner to trinidad and tobago as i have told earlier in couple of minutes back in my preliminary you know initiative is a outstanding scholar par excellence academician to the height and a researcher to the core apart from being having a secure diplomatic career his excellency sri sahu could enlighten on the most baffling and topical topic of today's discussion role of diplomacy or uh, for a stable global order in so friends to start this is not the absence of conflict it is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means which otherwise is known as diplomacy diplomacy can be defined as the conduct of international relations by negotiations and dialogue or by any other means to promote peaceful relations among nations the conflicting currents of the time politics among nation in morganto surrealism realistic approach as we are witness today the russian ukrainian crisis as our distinguished honorable speaker will well highlight and covering the entire gamut of the discourse diplomacy particularly in the multilateral global order has assumed greater significance as negotiations and other diplomatic methods have increasing relevance for the contemporary international conflict and relations and cooperation in a highly unstable world of multilateralism diplomacy can serve as a great and effective panacea to conflict situation and can be an important key to conflict resolution which our esteemed esteemed distinguished speaker his excellency sir arun kumar sahu will well highlight and delight in all of us thank you with these few words i just i uh, withdraw myself to stand as a barrier between the esteemed distinguished speaker and our attendees who are eagerly waiting to listen from a international reputed scholar and a diplomat uh, his excellency arun sahu arun kumar sahu thank you over to milan let me take this opportunity to thank dr pramod kumar ray well thank you so much sir for your words moving ahead with the proceedings now let me take the opportunity to invite dr charu arya ma'am director center for caste inclusion and social justice igpp assr for the introduction of the distinguished speaker for the session over to you charu ma'am Charu ma'am are you able to hear us <laughs> I request the OC to kindly connect with Charu ma'am Sir, there. Darmaam is there. Yeah, Hello. yeah, it's it's this is. Is he audible? Hi, yes, Charu Maam is speaking, but we can't hear. Oh, yes, she might have switched up, you know, or you know. No, no, no. She she is on uh, on mute, but there is some issue. Oh, technical might be some technical glitches, might be. So 
Prabhupada ji, can you just talk to her over phone? So, what is the actual problem? What is the? I'm not able to. Well, as we all know, techno, uh, techno, uh, technical glitches are something unavoidable as far as this era is concerned. So let's all wait while Sharu Ma'am is joining us back. For a few moments, we'll wait for her. Asuji, can you talk to Prabir ji so that she can Charu. connect? Charu, Charu, ma'am, could you please uh, unmute yourself and we can see you, but. Now, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Finally. Yeah, Finally. Yeah, quite Finally. Yeah. These technical, like, you know, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Am I audible and visible both, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to all present on our first international webinar. And uh, with, uh, like, a great respect on behalf of all of us, I uh, welcome you uh, to this, uh, uh, like you know, international uh, webinar, and uh, I'm here to uh, uh, introduce our esteemed guest for today, uh, His Excellency Arun Kumar Sahu sir. And uh, let me just read a brief bio note of his, and uh, I believe, like you know, uh, we could not have found a better. Uh, like, you know, or a great uh, speaker than what he is because his profile is wonderful. And I was just reading it and I, I have said a lot of respect for you for uh, the kind of experience that you have had. So, uh, Arun Kumar Sahu, sir, joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1996. He assumed charge in uh, High Commission of India Port of Spain on 3rd September 2019. Previously, he was uh, the Deputy High Commissioner of India in Canada, uh, uh, High Commissioner of India to Canada, based in Ottawa. Earlier to that, in New Delhi, he has served as Joint Secretary, Director of Journal, uh, heading the Division of Development Partnership Administration, Deputy Director General, Indian Council for Cultural Relations, Director Nepal and Bhutan and Under Secretary China. As a diplomat, he has served in Indian Embassy in Beijing twice, 1998 to 2001, and then 2010 to 2013, London 2004 to 2007, and Tehran 2007 to 2010. He served as a board member on the US India Educational Foundation from 2014 to 2016, and on the Canada India Center for Excellence in Science, Technology, Trade, uh, and Policy of Carleton University, Ottawa, Canada, from 2016 to 2019. He holds a master's degree in war in modern world uh, from King's College, London, and a master's degree in linguistics from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He speaks Odia, English, Hindi, Chinese, and writes essays, fictions, and columns in both Odia and English in his spare time. Iguana and Other Poems is his recently published poetry collection, which he wrote during the coronavirus pandemic. Other publication, publications include the celebrated short story collections in Odia, uh, Akshara, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, Lu Akshara Luha, which is Tears of the Sky in 2015, and then Chira Malata, the torn cover in 2017, and poetry collection, uh, Shunyara Shantulana, Balance of Zero, 2020. 2020. So, sir, uh, I think this is a wonderful combination of a person who is coming from 
uh, like you know the kind of international experience and also having such a great i think uh, creative output that you have been giving and i think you know sir i'm so much interested to read all these poems that have been published because i also come from the literature background and you know it's wonderful to see that the kind of sensitive topics that you have handled so i believe you are a wonderful combination of like you know having such qualities of being such an honorable like you know uh, international personality and at the same time a creative person at heart so thank you very much for joining us today and uh, with not sparing more time and we have already wasted so much of time in the technical problems so let's like you know go ahead with the event thank you very much thank you sir Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Charuvaria, ma'am, for that sweet and short introduction. Moving ahead with the proceedings of this webinar, now let me take the opportunity to invite Dr. Nibhati Dagiri, who is the director for Center for Gender Studies (IGPP) ASSSR, who will be serving as the chairperson for this session to give her opening remarks. Over to you, Nibhati, ma'am. A very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, good evening. And uh, I'm very much honored to uh, have with uh, the, the program. And uh, it's, it's, I'm feeling very wonderful. Uh, so let me begin because uh, time is a constant. Uh, so using diplomacy, you know, good offices and mediation have been recognized as the most important tools to bring peace and establish cooperative, cordial relations among nations. The United Nations that was created after Second World War promotes these tools to be practiced for conflict resolutions and maintaining peace in the world. Diplomatic efforts to resolve international conflicts constitute integral part of the foreign policy and statecraft. Hence, diplomacy has become more or less synonymous with the foreign policy. If we look at the empirical study, there are a lot of examples, a lot of events, examples, uh, since from the uh, you know, uh, traditional time past and currently we can look at diplomacy has served its purpose and a uh, lot of success stories we can see from that. If I look at the empirical study that suggests diplomatic relations in the world of national interest meant balancing or trading the competing interests of states against one another or finding common interest that could be the basis for agreement even in the face of other conflicting interests. So if we, you know, if I go back to Cold War period, if, you know, at a historical thing now, but a lot of things to be learned from there. A search for common interest was feature of Cold War era. Negotiation aimed, aimed at preventing military confrontation between the United States of America and Soviet Union. The negotiations to end the Cuban missile, that's a very an event which we study everyone, you know, in political science, history, and diplomacy and uh, Cuban missile crisis, and they develop confidence building measures for avoiding accidental nuclear war based on the common interest in reducing the risk of confrontation that might escalate the nuclear warfare at that point of time. Besides, there are several other examples if we look at the success of diplomatic efforts, such as during, you know, NATO intervention in Kosovo, Iraqi invasion or uh, at Kuwait, Chechenia issues, Tajik, numerous, you know, the list goes on. So, you know, we all understand that diplomatic efforts at times take long time to resolve conflicting issues. But at, at times the process is smooth and fast. See, the, the topic at present, I will not take much time, the topic at present, you know, the uh, today's topic is really, really very pertinent, you know, when the world is experiencing an ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. So it's a pleasure uh, to, and 
and all, we are honored to have a career diplomat amongst us to share the role of diplomacy in making and maintaining relationship among nations in the world for peaceful world order. So here, sir, uh, I am Nivedita, I'm just, uh, I welcome you. And uh, let us uh, see how far uh, the diplomacy, uh, you know, uh, the role of diplomacy and how important it is and, uh, you know, the nitty gritty, the difficulty, the challenges. Uh, you as a practitioner of diplomacy, uh, you, you, we are very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much and welcome. And now I welcome you to, you know, give your address. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. So, uh, good evening to all of you, Dr. Pramod Ray, uh, Chief Executive Institute of Governance and Public Policy. Dr. Asuje, President, other members of the Asiatic Society for uh, Social Science Research, faculty, academics, researchers, students, and other guests. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you on such a critical topic. For the next few minutes, let me share my overall perspective and spare some time for interaction. At the outset, allow me also to begin with a disclaimer that views expressed in this webinar do not represent the government of India, and they are meant for academic discussions only. It appears that human history is a continuum of order and disruption. And we assume the order as stability and peace. What Krishna calls dharma in Gita is essentially this order. And diplomacy as an instrument to achieve that order by preventing, managing, and resolving conflicts has a long history. In our epic Mahabharat, when Vidura asked Krishna why he was taking the pain to come to Hastinapur to pers persuade Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan not to fight, Krishna explained that it was his duty to give peace a final chance and avoid bloodshed. Similar was the role of Hanuman in the epic Ramayana, who visited Lanka to persuade Ravan not to enter a conflict. War and diplomacy have a rich Indian and Chinese intellectual discourse. In his The Art of War, Sunju suggested that the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting, which meant that diplomacy is a powerful means to subdue the enemy. Similarly, in his Earth Shastra, Kautilya mentioned four upayas, as you know, Sama Dhamma Danda Veda, as ways to avoid conflicts and maximize the kingdom's interest. He believed that treaties and agreements should benefit the king and the kingdom. In the West, the Greek city-states maintained diplomatic relations to safeguard and maximize their interests. They sent envoys to lodge protests of wrongs against their state and seek the release of citizens from captivity or represent the intentions of their ruler to manage potential conflicts. Since conflict was endemic in Greek interstate relations, diplomacy was mainly used to set the stage for bargaining or negotiating, characterized by positive inducements and threats. Coercive diplomacy was an essential instrument of negotiations, as you uh, must have read about the million dialogue. Structured diplomacy with administrative backing by the state 
began in the West in the 17th and 18th century with advanced map making techniques, the evolution of the idea of the nation state and the emergence of influential political philosophies. The agreements of the Peace of Westphalia and the treaties of Utrecht were two such attempts during this period. The West also experienced revolutionary ideas. One striking example, of course, was the French Revolution. Post-Emperor Napoleon uh, I, at the first, at the Vienna Conference in 1815, ambassadors of the then great powers attempted to stop the expansion of the revolutionary ideas and movements that swept Europe and beyond. Nevertheless, among others, the world experienced the Bolshevik Revolution and the Xinhai Revolution in China in 1911, and the West entered into what we know as First World War. Diplomacy worked in tandem to establish some sort of an order and peace post World War I in the form of the League of Nations, which, of course, as you know, did not last long, and we reached, we entered the Second World War. At the as the war broke out to end it from 1941 until its end, the big three nations the United Kingdom, the US and Soviet Union worked together in the Grand Alliance to defeat first Germany and then Japan. President Roosevelt, uh, Premier Stalin and Prime Minister Churchill met in Tehran in November 1943 to charter a course to open a Western Front for Operation Overload or the Battle of Normandy launched, of course, on 6th of June, 1944. The discussions revolved around the strategy to also counter Germany and decide a possible future of post-war Poland. Before Tehran, at the Washington Conference in December, January 1941-42, and the Casablanca Conference of January 1943, President Roosevelt and uh, Churchill accompanied by their top military advisors, discussed a joint American-British military command for the war against Germany. The Atlantic Charter was also issued on 14th of August, 1941, which set out American and British goals for a decolonized free world post Second World War, which, as you know, impacted to some extent the independence of India. Subsequently, victory on site, the Yalta Conference in February 1945 chartered the stakes of the victors in post-war Germany and Poland. And it also decided that US, as you know, USSR can join the war against Japan three months after Germany surrenders. The strategy to deal with uh, Japan was also discussed. And of course, the contours of the Security Council and the permanent members with veto power at the new UN, United Nations. Both Yalta and Potsdam, Potsdam conferences could not resolve the victors' conflicting strategic and ideological interests. And the world entered into a period of uneasy order based on the balance of power, spheres of influence, and the arms race. Of great importance at this time was the addition of the atom bomb to the arsenal. In a sense, while giving a final blow to the war, the atom bomb opened a salvo of Cold War, adding a new dimension of nuclear diplomacy in the Cold War period. Establishment of the United Nations and the Bretton Woods institutions initiated multilateral diplomacy to manage interstate political, economic, and trade relations. On the surface of it, the UN was intended to avert the need, as then US Secretary of State uh, Cordell Hall put it, for spears of 
influence for alliances for the balance of power. However, the UN became an instrument of the dominant powers to further their geopolitical and geoeconomic interests. Simultaneously, it was also used to avert potential conflicts, manage conflicts through peacekeeping, and provide humanitarian assistance to ensure peace and order. The onset of the Cold War was marked by events in East and Central Europe, Germany, and Korea. The US diplomacy gravitated towards elements of the diplomatic diplomat George Cannon's long telegram, as you know, of 1946, Truman Doctrine, and the Marshall Plan. The Soviet Union objected, resulting in the Berlin uh, blockade in June 1948 and the diplomacy of containment. The Soviets sponsored a coup in Czechoslovakia and repressed non-communists in Hungary. NATO subsequently took birth in 1952 and as a response, Warsaw Pact also in 1955, which in a sense ensured a balance of power or what we call equilibrium of fear. In Asia, Mao Zedong established the People's Republic of China on 1st October 1949, uh, adding a third dominant power to diplomacy, first in the form of Sino-Soviet friendship, then Sino-Soviet split, and subsequently the US-China rapprochement in the 1970s. It played a significant role in the vacuum space in Asia left by the defeat of Japan. The task before diplomacy became complex throughout the Cold War, though mainly it was a bipolar world. While Europe had relative stability, conflicts erupted outside Europe in the Middle East, Africa, part of Asia, and Latin America. Decolonization and the policy of non-alignment by many developing countries added to its complexity. Diplomacy traded in the gray areas of North-South and South-South cooperation. And international aid and trade became a new tool of interstate relationship. Latin America emerged as one of the hottest battlegrounds while direct Soviet involvement outside of Cuba remained minimal, calls for throwing off the yoke of the Yankee American imperialism led to the espousal of revolutionary and left-wing causes. The main focus of diplomacy in this region was to prevent the spread of communism by using financial aid and building regional institutional structures to counter anti-American movements, and where that failed to use covert and overt military intervention aimed at toppling undesirable governments. Carrot and stick policy and regime change became a norm to establish regional order until the fall of the Berlin Wall and the disintegration of Soviet Union. The beginning of a unipolar movement in 1989 provided equally fertile ground for order and disorder, peace and chaos, and regional stability and instability. Developments in Eastern Europe and transition in South Africa appeared to herald positive outcomes, but conflicts associated with weak and failed states surfaced in the, in the former Yugoslavia and parts of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. You, uh, you will remember Gulf War, Iran, Iraq War, and all those. Uh, if one is a liberal optimist like Francis Fukuyama of the end of history fame, one may be triumphalist, very happy. But if one is a realist like, let's say, uh, John Muir Seimer, one would argue that the end of Cold War spelled an end to stability. NATO expanded to the East under the Partnership for Peace Plan 
the united nation became a global vehicle to drive development agendas and humanitarian aid the the disarmament of belligerents free and fair elections and protection of human rights it worked for global solutions to universal local problems to bridge the developmental gap while diplomacy of the superpower worked to ensure the continuation of unipolarity that of other countries tailored their strategy to extract maximal benefit from globalization energy security and environmental issues became critical while the powers aspire to control global fossil fuel resources interest classed and the reputation of the united nation as a collective security provider had dents however low profile diplomacy led to some positive outcome uh, like the arab israel uh, disc uh, uh, peace discussion in madrid in 1991 economic diplomacy occupied significant attention in the early 1990s geo economics had a new focus on the asia pacific region as the asian tigers enjoyed a period of massive economic growth as you were aware from 1989 to 1996 average growth rates across asean were over 7% elsewhere in east asia say in south south korea taiwan and hong kong they registered average growth rate of over 9% heralding a possible pacific century till the bubble burst in 1997 out of this crisis emerged china as a formidable economic and military power in asia dwarfing japan geopolitics gradually shifted in asia the indo-pacific region and the south china sea long inactive historical flash points in east asia received new energy to simmer again diplomacy geared to manage these potential conflicts as the twin towers of world trade center in new york collapsed on 11 september 2001 the world entered into a new phase of instability and diplomacy acted swiftly to garner support for global war on terror world opinion was galvanized the french newspaper uh, for instance le monde even put on its front page the headline we are all americans the day after the attack president bush pronounced our war on terror begins with al qaeda but it does not end there it will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found stopped and defeated by september 2001 the taliban and al qaeda were intertwined and by october the war against afghanistan was launched the period between the end of cold war and 911 can be seen in terms of a hiatus in realist diplomacy however post 911 attacks superpower rivalry was galvanized once more although differently it depended on how a power perceived terrorism in a region the threat was no longer from conventional conflict between competing blocks instead it was terrorism across the block or crossing the border as the world experienced an economic crisis in 2008 the us the only superpower with global military reach showed reluctance to play the role of a global policeman to maintain peace and order throughout the world and in 2012 china began asserting itself as an economic superpower and the murmur of a great game and a new cold war between the us and china dominated the diplomatic discourse today china is a global economic power yet a global military power it has demographic weight territorial size scientific advancements and its permanent seat on the united nations security council there has been an on declared arms race between us and china mainly in the sea 
cyber world and artificial intelligence. One can observe an environment of 19th century diplomacy with 21st century weapons. We are in an uncertain world. Some expect a multipolar world order to emerge and others anticipate a new Cold War. In a new Cold War, flash points in Asia will likely get a new life and possible regional balances will emerge in multipolarity. States are already positioning themselves and while doing so, they're using the advantages of technological revolution, global connectivity, mass media, and public diplomacy to further their geopolitical ambitions. The Ukraine crisis indicates that as long as China does not emerge as a net global security provider, Russia will continue to play its historic strategic role in global geopolitics. Besides strategic rebalancing, the Ukraine crisis is also likely to redefine energy diplomacy in Europe and outside Europe. Summarily, therefore, the present approach of diplomacy will factor in mainly the following four aspects, what I think. Namely, how hard will China push in Asia? How much instability will Russia spread in Europe? How much presumptive stability will the United States inject into the Middle East and Asia? And how various regional players realign their interstate relations? China maintains a strategic culture of brutal self-interest. International relations theorists like John uh, J. Mayer Seimer views China as a threat to the US-led stable world order and the world according to Mia Seimer must be prepared to confront China. Nevertheless, the Biden administration strategy has been what I think is to push back harder on China's militarization while strengthening like-minded regional powers to rebalance China while avoiding the risk of conflict. Hence, I think it's support for Taiwan and Israel, silent support for Germany's posturing in Europe, Britain's post-Brexit attempt of power projection, Saudi Arabia's seeking up of the regional balance of power, Iran's search for a partnership, and both AUKUS and Koth are also part, seems to be part of this strategy. India itself, has a tradition of cautelier diplomacy, a mix of national strengths, control aggression, and external relationships. The policy of non-alignment, forging of Afro-Asian solidarity in the Bandung era, regional aspirations between 1971 and 1991, engaging with global powers, developing robust economic economic relations and engaging in regional milli and multilateral frameworks like BRICS called SCO Indo-Pacific. Besides cultivating solid bilateral ties are some of these, some of the indicators. The causes of conflict is multidimensional. Besides both hot and cold wars, failed states run by repressive regimes ethnic discrimination, deep religious divides, and competition for scant resources could trigger local and regional conflicts, which sometimes warrant external, regional, or multilateral diplomatic intervention. In essence, diplomacy works on the principles of prevention of a conflict, prevention of the spread of an ongoing conflict, managing a conflict and prevention of the re-emergence of the same conflict. As you appreciate, the role of diplomacy in conflict resolution is not always crowned with success. This is due to multiple internal and external factors. There is, however, no other better alternative. Diplomacy is the art of the feasible to work on possibilities 
to ensure the much desired peace and stability while maximizing national interest. Diplomacy works behind the camera and is not black or white, and it has to trade in the gray. Economic sanctions, blockades, controlled military intervention, mass media, and social media management are modern day diplomacy. All that one sees in the public domain is the management of statecraft to enhance a nation's bargaining power. Only after declassifying secret documents and communications, one knows the strategies that diplomacy has adopted to achieve the desired objective. Today, diplomacy has acquired importance more than ever due to the non-emergence of apparent new world order. And it has become much more crucial for countries in a critical state of transition. I think let me stop here and uh, listen to your comments and questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good I would like to thank our esteemed guest for the day who has thrown such light and given us such an insight into the topic of role of diplomacy in conflict resolution for a stable and peaceful global order. Well, moving ahead with the proceedings of the session, let me hand it over to the chairperson, the moderator of the session for her closing remarks. Over to you, Nivedita Ma. Thank you so much, Milan. Uh, His Excellency, it was really wonderful uh, to hear you. And um, surprisingly, you know, you have, you have covered the the global uh, scenario here, and you know, like uh, uh, giving a um, in giving uh, going back to the roots, like you know, religion and tradition. Krishna uh, uh, during Mahabharata time, then Ramayana, explaining the traditional roots of uh, diplomacy in India, and uh, also the study of politics uh, globally. Uh, evolution of this uh, diplomacy uh, as an as an important uh, statecraft, uh, you know, uh, from the um, tradition to the Europeans' uh, time and uh, uh, the complete evolution, you know, uh, gradual uh, development. Uh, the uh, you have mentioned a lot of you have given a lot of examples, and um, uh, I just felt like I, I have gone back to my PhD coursework class. And it was excellent and uh, very, very elaborative uh, to, uh, to all of us to um, uh, recall and uh, re reconnect uh, um, ourselves to the initiatives, the efforts taken by various regional groups, multilateral diplomatic initiatives, bilateral initiatives, uh, uh, African initiative, uh, you know, other continents like Asia, non-alignment movement. So, um, Really, it was uh, uh, great to hear you. You talked about uh, Atlantic Charter, U.S. and European to, you know, uh, so decolonize that particular effort, which I think is, is very important uh, outcome of uh, the diplomatic initiative at that point of time, post-war period. Uh, Britain news system, which we are, all are experiencing at the point at present, you know, in the global global politics, globalized <laughs> era, uh, where the multilateral dip diplomatic initiatives uh, outcome of that that we see that the political uh, global polit uh, economic global political economy has been uh, uh, taken a shape, new shape, you know, then. Um, uh, His Excellency, you have also given a, you know, um, the, the the North South division and uh, covering the whole, you know, world. <laughs> Arab Israel, the low profile diplomatic uh, development in uh, uh, Arab world, uh, the new Cold War between China and US uh, after the, you know, the 90s. So. Um, uh, Thank you so much. Um, and the possible role also you, are, you have talked about uh, of China uh, in the present uh, crisis time uh, between Russia and uh, Ukraine conflict. And um, 
I believe, you know, you also talked about this, that diplomatic initiatives are most of the time secret and brought into brought to public uh, after the success of the initiatives. Thank you so much. And um, now uh, the floor is, I think, open for the question, uh, question Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Nivedita Giri. Thank you so much, ma'am, for throwing light and analysis on the session on the talk that we just had. To move ahead with the proceedings of the session, this session is never complete without having a discussion. To initiate the discussion, the question and answer round. Now, let me take the opportunity to invite Dr. Sanjay Kumar Agrawal, Director, Center for Decentralized Governance, IGPP, ASSSR. Sir, let me request you to kindly take the proceedings further. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. It's a very good presentation. Uh, we, have, we have been indebted to have uh, His Excellency High Commissioner Arun Kumar Sahuji, and uh, really he has given a very nice presentation in the context of present era uh, in the world order, new world order for that. And I understand also uh, he, he rightly said that diplomacy is an important tool uh is in serving the peaceful conflict resolutions in the present context even but i i understand that conflict is an important provisions even inevitable in a formal setup which is unavoidable and i personally feel that it it brings to a good results ultimately towards the solution why what i feel that Conflict is a, just a difference of opinion. It is not a war. The difference of opinion, uh, its own uh, seeing the things from own perspective. From that, uh, from that, uh, that note, you have rightly said highlighted number of important issue uh, from the Treaty of Westphalia to modern context. You know, sir, rightly you have rightly pointed out. How I also understand that Westphalia Treaty is a serve as a foundation stone of the modern nation state. So uh, it's really wonderful. And uh, I hope that audience must have uh, a great opportunity to learning the role of diplomacy in peaceful conflict resolutions in the present days phenomena. So I think now the floor is open for the question and succession. So I invite, you can raise your doubt and concerns Anyone? Go ahead. You have any doubt, clarifications? Or even you can put your questions in the chat box also. There's a question from the chat box. Uh, sir, I'm just referring a question from the chat box. Yeah. They know everybody has uh, can't see anything. Put, uh, uh, rightly said that this presentation is very nice, informative sessions and uh, fascinating to have geopolitics and I are very smoothly. Uh, uh, but no specific question over there. Anyone okay. who can ask a question can raise their hands, please. Anyone from the audience? You are free to ask. Hello. There is a one, there is a one yes. question, sir, from the Ankit. Okay. He says, there sir, can you hands if you can see the hands? Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the recognition. My question is a bit specific to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I would like to give I would like to hear your analysis on the fact that to what extent can we credit the diplomatic relations that John F. Kennedy initiated during the Cuban Missile Crisis? What is your take on this? Uh, see, uh, you know, diplomacy is not uh, something which is as I understand it. Uh, not something which is distance from statecraft. It's actually for a leader. It is a tool 
which is part of the state graph. So what he is doing is he has a uh, has an instrument which he is using to maximize his own interest. So if you see the uh, 62 missile crisis, you know, it's a classic. So many people have written about this and analyzed how things are. But ultimately, both the superpowers came to the balance of power mode and an understanding that you will not fiddle with my sphere of influence and I will not fiddle with your sphere. So the understanding of sphere of influence, that this is yours and this is mine. And that is how we balance the uh, world order henceforth is the success of diplomacy. So what he is doing essentially while while you were putting missiles in Cuba and uh, you know in uh, in uh, so what he is trying to do is it's called it he is pushing the negotiations or push, trying to say something to a it's called brinkmanship in uh, diplomacy that you have you maximize your uh, uh, you know desire in a public domain saying unless you give me uh, you know 100% i'm not going to back down you know but the back channel discussion is where the red lines are you do a maximal projection first in uh, public who is the media keeps on uh, you know carrying and then say oh cc uh, power x is saying this power y is saying this there will be a war there you know this whole hype you know, so uh, the whole media is also uh, don't uh, for for a, uh, a practitioner who is actually managing the state. The media is one instrument. He doesn't see media as a public. Uh, you know, he sees it as one instrument. He back 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 channel is one instrument. Using diplomats are one in one instrument, and then you know, finally he is trying to. Uh, he decides what are the things that he is going to divulge to the public to get the national support, you know, people uh, people support, and how much he can back down, and what will be what will be a, an acceptable solution, so that his position as a leader is also consolidated. So, if you see, if you try to read. You know, both Kennedy's and uh, his mind, both have worked on this. One is democracy, the other one is, you, know, you can say the ideological difference, but the purpose, the objective is the same. To maxim maximize, I don't want you in my backyard. And he's saying, I don't want you in my backyard. You know, so ultimately, let's sit down and decide from now onwards that these are our respective backyards. So that is how I think, I think, uh, but as you, uh, if you want the whole Cuban missile crisis and all this, you can get into the whole, there's, there's I think, whole lot of, uh, and that is one of the uh, incidents which has been so written about and researched and all, so many uh, documents, you know, so many people have done PhDs on those. Uh, that area you can uh, read all those but as a practicing diplomat i can always say uh, this is how you know as uh, as the i i must tell you the difference between an academic and a diplomat is you have to explicit explicitly spell out everything in a paper that you are writing to make an argument You know, I, as a diplomat, I do not spell out. I presume that whoever is reading or whoever is, uh, you know, whoever I'm targeting my, my ideas or alternatives, I presume that he knows what I'm trying to say. 
without explicitly you know pronouncing in words that this is what i am saying so that is why when you get declassified material or when you see you know press releases and statements and all this why which diplomats are saying it is most important to understand what he is actually not saying so what do we call the reading between the lines you know so if you are asking for clear black and white answer from a uh, from a state when the issue is there i don't think you will get anything but whatever he is putting out in the public domain if you try to read it in the context of his or uh, you know basically the how the state is behaving and what are the things that he is trying to trying you to capture but explicitly not telling you i think then your research will have a uh, will look for all those declassified material try to relate those things to what is happening in a present context or in in one incident and then you can uh, you know extrapolate oh this is what this is how it is done it's a very um, it looks very simple but uh, it's a it's a complex um, i think uh, a profession which handles complexity of different nature thank you i hope i answered your question <laughs> well and beat sir thank you so much i just wanted to know answer from you because as you mentioned there's a huge difference between a one who's practicing it and one who's researching on it so thank you so much sir thank thank you sir there is a question from the chat box one questions from the ankit he just wanted to know your real life experiences in this area uh, and uh, another questions from the nirad i want to take this also what are the diplomatic challenges to diplomacy please uh, these two questions if you can explain so that they can satisfy see for real for, life, uh, for uh, real real life experiences you have to have a uh, a private room where i can be in uh, in a uh, <laughs> in right, a right. informal setting to you know yeah. say some uh, incidents but, i can understand uh, not in the public domain that yeah, as yeah. i said you know uh, many uh, retired diplomats have written books and all this you know they do uh, but if you also uh, read their books there are many things he they don't uh, they just hint for all of you to uh, try to understand but they don't uh, normally uh, normally explicitly tell you that this is what uh, but i think that's a, that's a, uh, that will give me a some uh, future engage informal engagement with you so we'll keep that for diplomatic right, sir, uh, right. the second one is diplomatic uh, what is domestic challenges to diplomacy Do domestic challenges to diplomacy domestic challenges to uh, diplomacy you right, know uh, diplomacy is there are two uh, a two major thing in diplomacy one is to understand your own domestic strength if you don't understand if there you know if you if we don't understand the diplomatic uh, the domestic strength then we don't know how to negotiate so your negotiation strategy or your negotiation um, uh, let's say red lines are internally designed based on your domestic strength so your domestic strength is your demography your uh, military power your economic power your uh, existing uh, relations with other countries in the neighborhood in distance place in with p power uh, p5 countries you know how so all these are essential factors before you do a negotiating you you actually design a negotiating strategy for a to deal with a particular nation or a region or a group unless you have really a clear understanding of your uh, your strength you are going to falter there so you must okay. understand that's that's that is and the challenges are there itself you know you know what are the what are the strengths 
what are the weaknesses where i don't i i have to protect my interest and where i can actually give something to maximize my interest nation's interest in such a way that it will be beneficial to the overall uh, you know uh, overall uh, nation state of india in future there is a short term goal you define it there is a medium term goal and also there are long term perspectives that if i if we do it today what will happen after 20 years for example all those energy security issues and all you always look at a longer take a longer perspective you know issues which are uh, uh, which needs to be resolved in the next 5 6 years 10 years and you take a uh, you know a calculated uh, position where you take some risk also and you take some uh, advantage also so see you must also understand this in this profession the guy the person whom you are talking to he is also trying to do the same thing that you are trying to do he is also trying to maximize his nation's interest the way you are doing it he also knows what are your you know in to some extent he also knows what are your strengths and weaknesses the way you know what are his strength and weaknesses so when we talk about win win synergies you know so what we essentially look at is this is your strength this is my strength if we work together then we will maximize our own interests so let's work together there are issues which are which where there is differences so there can we have a common ground that is the challenge if we have a common ground are you going to benefit out of it and i am i going to benefit out of it i think if you see there is a mutual benefit then you you create a common ground this saying this is this is how we are going to uh, approach it and then what what comes to the uh, public uh, and all this is your all your you know so called uh, joint statements and press releases and all those which which comes to you to say that this is this has been done in a uh, bilateral or a regional uh, forum or in a multilateral forum i think uh, so i won't say there are act. our job is essentially to understand our own uh, strength and weaknesses so that is where uh, the domestic uh, all that domestic setup actually comes to uh, play so we are we are pretty uh, uh, i think many of you might be thinking these guys actually stay outside and they don't have a sense of what is happening back in india but uh, we actually know what is what is actually happening in the in india and what is our strength and what is our weaknesses we won't, we might not spell it out but uh, that's not our uh, job but then those are the factors which are uh, which are which actually influence the way we uh, design something right sir right okay. sir thank you sir there there are linked questions from dr vivekananda uh, domestic issues are very important to consider the external affairs his question is to how can overcome this so far as diplomacy is concerned it is linked questions if you can partly no. answer Yeah, see there are two things uh, there are two things i should tell you you know the, the way i uh, i see it is that i have always maintained that the world order or let's say the world uh disturbance of let's say uh, let me put it this way that uh, disorder and disturbance and clon conflict is actually the state of affair of the world this is a natural state of affair what we call order and peace it comes and goes so if i change your whole thinking saying that uh, i am always i mostly i am sad but happiness comes and goes so okay sir uh, what will happen is your whole thinking will shift so if you see human history you know 
if if you see our we are we are one of the oldest civilizations if you see our civilizational history it is actually disorder and conflict which is the natural state of affair of human being and in between comes peace and order peace and order but we generally that's my views don't say that this is the this is, this is how i i have seen uh, you know i see the whole global uh, you know uh, historical development that uh, in between comes the peace and order but if we if i as a diplomat uh, think that i am in a constant state of peace and order and conflict actually comes and goes then i'm actually i'll be missing to find out where the potential conflicts are coming and going so i put myself in a in a position where i say disorder is the natural state of affair and order will come and go so let's always be careful of the disorder part orders will come and go that is uh, that is how one uh, ask one way of looking at it i i forgot your second question if you uh, tell me uh his question is to how can to overcome this so far as diplomacy is concerned uh, no, so domestic. you answer uh, uh domestic issues uh, yeah you know diplomacy uh, actually works to maximize the interest of the state in a way that it will help address the weakness of the state so essentially whatever is the domestic weakness that we are looking at diplomacy actually works with other countries to bridge that gap the, this is our uh, uh, weakness let's work on it so that after 10 years or 15 years or 20 years this area we are stronger so we don't uh, we actually don't take uh, we know that these are the positive these are the negative but when you uh, project the positive you also are mindful how to work so that in future these countries or these set of countries will actually help us to mitigate what is uh, what is the negative that i have today you may may not see you know that's the whole uh, beauty of uh, diplomacy that you may not see the result in a year two year or three years some of the results you might see quickly but some of the results you will see after uh, maybe a decade saying oh there is a policy that we had taken which uh, is now um, uh, you know contributing to the national strength so uh, that is that is how i look at uh, diplomacy and that's how i look at statecraft right sir right sir there is a question from the manas how to solve the current circumstances of ukraine and russia if 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 only i know i wouldn't be sitting here yeah yeah right sir right sir so the next question sir now russian diplomacy at the barrel of gun is it helpful to russia thank to you thank you sir for your beautiful answer sir sir thank you sir for your beautiful answer sir sir my sir dr vivekananda singh sir thank you thank you thank you for that namaste namaste namaskar yeah please sir, go ahead sir the question from nirad uh, now russian diplomacy at the barrel of gun is it helpful to russia to reconstruct soviet union <laughs> you know see uh, that that is uh, uh let me let me put it this way the phrases like uh, barrel of gun you know whether is going back to uh, soviet union i think it, these are so uh, loaded uh, uh, phrases and those are conjunction there are you know there are journalistic language let me let me put it this way these are these are languages which are used in a uh, in a common parlance or in journalist you know saying oh oh they are doing this hey, they are doing that so but for us to me if you ask before writing the para, the the phrase barrel of gun i have to be really convinced myself that there is a state called russia who has a history of all this 
you know, before Bolshevik revolution, and there is a leader, and what is going on in his mind? No, we don't know what is going on in it. people wish that they can read uh, Mr. Putin's mind, you know, but it doesn't happen like that. So uh, when you you know you have the freedom to use these phrases, I don't have the freedom, and I'm not convinced to use this kind of phrases to explain something because I am in the middle of. let's say diplomats are in the middle of as you know as the conflict is also going you see one thing in the in the in the television and all those happening but you also don't see what is happening is the whole rounds and rounds of discussions with various people various leaders which are doing uh, behind the camera you know when there will be a ceasefire or there is something some some um, uh, let's say negotiation negotiating position then the whole world will know that uh, yes this is what has uh, has happened and now this is the so you know i think my my short response will be i am very uncomfortable with uh, with uh, these kind of phrases and my effort in the last uh, uh, few years whenever i interact with uh, you know intellectuals like you academics like you researchers like you to uh, sensitize that journalistic language is not necessarily the academic language so the researcher's language has to be very very uh, you know empirical based on facts and documents resources and then you make your own judgment saying what is happening you now let journalists do their work there is a purpose behind why they are doing it let academics do their work there is a purpose behind why you are doing a research on such and such and there is a whole practicing diplom diplomats leave them their job they will do their work and they will feed you with certain things they will not feed you with such, certain other things so i think we have our own uh, lexicon to express something and that is very important that uh, we know our lexicon academics know their own lexicon and of course journalists are the free uh, you know fourth pillar of the society so you can't do anything about it right sir right sir Thank there you. is a question from one guest uh, is the policy of non alignment is not more relevant it is it is it i think it is always forget about the history of non alignment but see the whole idea of non alignment how uh, we use it from context to context you know okay. so okay. anywhere that's that's the beauty of it anywhere that india wants to protect its strategic independence it becomes non aligned right sir right sir there is a question from isan can we categorize the idea of diplomacy in some kinds of particular school of thought like idealism or realism or is, or it is a kind of general conceptions which can be applied in a different schools of thought accordingly yeah that's a that's a very good question i must say that uh, as practitioners as academics individuals do matter and individuals are not uh, isolated human beings they have their own uh, ideas and they have their own theoretical underpinning you know so uh, i think the theories of ir or theories of statecraft are very very uh, critical for uh, not only for uh, academics of course you people deal with it but even for us to understand so as you know you know in 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 uh, in uh, international relations the dominant uh, theory is the realism you know till now from classical realism to neo realism you know so uh, and in between there are there are uh, there are phases where liberals have really dominated the space and on uh, all those uh, you know counter arguments and all this but the world somehow 
keeps coming back to realism in some form or other other you know and then it has its own uh, so it's it's really important there are uh, constructivism also you know there are various people who believe in certain things you have a whole soft power uh, business which is part of the uh, so depending on the country that you are dealing with depending on the region that you are dealing with and uh, depending on what is your uh, national interest i think these are these theoretical uh, uh, understanding are essentially arsenals so uh, wherever it is required you to be little realistic in by by ir term i'm saying realistic you be little realistic when you want to be little liberal and which helps your national interest you shift to liberalism so we are not bound by a particular uh, you know ideology as such but it's very important for us to uh, function as effective uh, diplomats to understand not only what you are thinking as academicians but also what the uh, you know public at large seeing what is happening is very important we don't dismiss academics you know what we do is we actually uh, uh, observe read and try to understand how the academic community is trying to uh, analyze things and whether there are there are elements which can be really used in practice so um, you know there are many ideas that uh, academics will give researchers will give you know which will which we say oh can be used we won't tell you when to use it but obviously uh, and of course the public pulse of diplomacy that is important for the for the state craft you know that is that has to be taken care of right sir right sir there is there is a question thank you sir from... is the last question from the chat box sir i have on what yeah yeah okay okay please. sir you wait sir wait sir parmo sir please yeah so uh, uh thank you arun sir for your such an enlightening yeah. deliberation talking upon the entire gamut of diplomacy in a different time conjecture and its intervening role in establishing world peace global peace but my question the most baffling and pertinent question pertains to the present impaired and crisis a conflict situation between russia and ukraine as many of the security theoreticians and policy experts and in foreign policy experts are insisting upon that the present you know side by side the war there is a negotiation is going on between ukraine and russia and rounds and round talks have been also initiated but the result the outcome the net outcome is nothing but there are you know security experts and foreign policy experts are arguing that russia is insisting for the appeasement diplomacy appeasement diplomacy which dates back its origin to 1860 Which the British, you know, Great Britain used it in 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 its you know in order to avoid war and gradually its expansion, imperial expansion policy. So this particularly in 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 a Russian and Ukrainian crisis, the appeasement diplomacy, which Russia wants a coercive in insisting upon a coercive diplomacy, and some insisting to Ukraine to go for appeasement diplomacy. That means to surrender unconditionally. surrender surrender unconditionally without you know uh, obtaining anything worthwhile in return so don't you think this appeasement diplomacy can serve the purpose in establishing peace in in a global order see this is this is a current situation and uh, if you have i think you you must have followed what uh, our foreign minister is saying and what mea is saying about these things but i can tell you uh, uh, one let's say uh, let me put it this way that uh, there is a way also there is one way of looking at the whole dynamics is that for the last many years 
someone has you know it's like a uh, uh, it's like uh, two brothers let me were two friends or brothers or two players you know what he has done is the one player who is telling for the last many years that you are doing foul you were not listening to me every time we play you were doing a foul and foul and foul and foul you know the other guy is saying when did i do the foul when did i do the foul and finally the guy said oh for the last many years you have not listened to me now you were pushing me to do something so that you will listen okay so is that the situation we actually don't know what is going on behind the scene what are the negotiations and you know it's only the media who is talking about uh, you know putin is asking for this russia is asking for this russia but listen nobody knows exactly what is actually under the what is on the table what is being negotiated behind the uh, behind the scene when uh, you know uh, uh, things are happening in ukraine so uh, but see i uh, <laughs> international relations is also uh, not a you know uh, let me put it this way or uh, either uh, take it or leave it it's not like take it and leave it there are another party also so yeah. while you do the negotiations you know with from a maximalist position i think both sides must have de decided their red lines that beyond this below this i am not going to compromise and the other guy must be saying that this i am not going to compromise so they have to ultimately i think what will happen is they will come to some kind of accepted um, uh, you know solution that this is where we will stop and then all this thing will uh, stop again uh, you know these we can we can when i am uh, back in delhi we can actually uh, talk privately about what is the appeasement diplomacy how the british did it how the americans look at it how big powers look at it how we look at it you know everybody as i said the all these nation states states let me put it this way have their own national interest as the as the agenda so they will use all kinds of instruments to maximize their national interest which appears which might appear to you him media and all this that this is appeasement diplomacy this is this this is that all kinds of you know words and phrases will be uh, uh, will be coined so that uh, you will say this is a aggressor somebody else is benign you know so that's part of uh, we what we call um, the public diplomacy diplomacy so what you uh, what are the things that you uh, say with the media so that your where i said that your uh, um, you know uh, negotiating position become stronger so you you are in a basically essentially what i am saying is you are in a profession where you are using everybody to max maximize your own negotiation negotiating strength see the same media the other guy is also reading they are also uh, you know uh, they oh, this is what your media is saying this is my media is saying so there is a media media to media thing also which is going on so you create an atmosphere of which is of your own desire you know if you are very powerful you create your own narrative if you are less powerful you create your narrative in a little uh, less because all uh, resources you know. so uh, i think it's a it's a very nice uh, very good question but which will need uh, informal discussion over uh, we can go through the whole what british did what the americans did you know from uh, each each incident or each policy that they have taken many of them are actually many of these documents are now declassified so you can get a sense of uh, what they did you know so uh, you will know if you see the media of that time and the what the leaders were saying and if you if you take a um, uh, if you take a, a 
correlation with the declassified material you'll know exactly what what was his public posture and what was the negoti negotiating stand which was going behind the uh, door i think uh, that is how it works thanks sir so thank very you appreciate invite me for uh, yeah but, but one one thing so do you agree with me that morganto's perception of uh, terming appeasement diplomacy uh, as uh, un politically unwise and also immoral so, no no but see listen listen Mar morganto is a realist okay yeah. so you can he put a theory he try to understand this and subsequently of course uh his students you know and mir saimer all those uh, all those uh, kaplan and all those people have evolved this thing so classical realism has come to uh, realism realism has become new realism now re new realism you know doesn't uh, they don't stick to the particular principles that marganthaw had said there is there is evolution of those ideas now um, mir saimer talks about you know uh, liberal hegemony and all kinds of things you know new new elements are there so uh, walls talks about different things so uh, depending on how the world is moving and how uh, developments are happening in the world uh, theories subsequent theories have actually evolved those uh, those uh, you know theoretical model no uh, no theory is actually iron cast you know the moment it is iron cast then it's finished it has to have that um, process of redefining itself take uh, in, uh, take uh, empirical evidence and then uh, you know examine how how far it has succeeded and then if it has not succeeded be honest to understand that there are elements which can be incorporated to the theory so um, you know theory is as i said uh theory for me is is a framework where i try to understand what is happening and it gives a uh, gives a framework how i i uh, you know craft my strategy to uh negotiate or look at things which will be useful to protect my own interest till that point of time i think uh theory has a, a meaning for us but uh, unless uh, unless you are earning your bread and butter from uh, academics you don't want to get into this whole <laughs> you know <laughs> argument and counter argument of what morgan thau said what the subsequent uh, theorists have said and all this you know that's a, that's a very academic discussion actually yeah thank you thank you sir thank you there is a question from the student vansika she wanted to ask international media is trying to shut all sources through which russian side can be heard isn't promoting bias another question from her only is there is still a scope for resolution of conflict in russian ukraine crisis through diplomacy if yes how please share your thoughts tell me is there any Uh, issues in the world which has not been managed or resolved or um, uh, you know addressed by diplomacy till now everything including cold war including world war second you know has been re managed resolved and concluded through diplomacy so obviously you know logically there will be a diplomatic solution this is a whole crisis which is have just happened now you know about the media again i can tell you that we understand only english language media please also understand language plays a very vital role in uh, what is happening what is coming to your uh, you know smartphone so uh, and somebody somebody is also pushing those things you know there's a whole the uh, if you if you talk about um, it's a different topic of talking talking about the politics of media you must understand the politics behind what what the what is the news that i am going to make it make as breaking news you know 
common man is uh, common man is very simple i must say right sir right sir thank you sir there is a last question from the chat box sir in this era how can a small country save its self interest if it is self interest are uh, sorry if self interest are clashing with big powers what about the sovereignty of a small country in diplomacy in the context of russia and ukraine what well, you tell me what did uh, political theories or ir theories talked about big power and small power diplomacy asymmetrical diplomacy when the strength are asymmetrical there is a whole school of thought you know how to deal with asymmetrical what is small and big so uh, you know there are war of attrition there is this asymmetrical war power warfare and all those things which are there so in fact all these uh, possible answers that you were looking for has been discussed in the past by uh, by academics uh, various academics that uh, kotilya himself says ki if you are small you know there is a if there is a power uh, equation then the big will uh, big will, <laughs> will try to swallow you that's what it is isn't it so in today's world i think it don't swallow you but uh, obviously he is because he is big he has his own advantage so you have to get you have to try to get what best you can get out of it see it's like it's very simple actually if you see a diplomacy it looks it will be very simple if you make it very simple it's like uh, you know two neighbors or two uh, friends who somebody is six feet tall the other one is five feet tall they talk to each other the five feet tall will be always thinking that he's so tall i won't fight with him if i fight i should have some arsenal with me you know i think these are these are what are the common uh, understanding are also part of the uh, common understanding in in, in uh, diplomacy but of course uh, there are various theories which has been developed uh, how to deal with asymmetrical warfare how to deal with asymmetrical power equations and uh, you know um, i think small countries have their own uh, own as i said their own strength and their weaknesses they have to work on the strength and uh, you know i think uh, try to try to uh, work in such a way that their weaknesses doesn't pull them back thank you right sir right sir there is a question also from the chat box from the richa Sir, on what circumstances a diplomat suggests a path of war instead of peace? Ha! You read, uh, you read, uh, you know, post eighty nine history. You know where uh, where war has or limited conflict or controlled conflict or controlled, uh, you know, intervention, military intervention has become part of, uh, you know, diplomacy. when where there is a situation where you think that uh, you can control your uh, aggression and then uh, and and also bring out an outcome with minimal damage you don't want a uh, public relation fiasco also so what you want is you know quick uh, solution oriented and uh, i know then it becomes uh, your uh, part of your arsenal say oh i'll do it and finish it come back that's how you uh, do it and there are many instances in uh, i think uh, post cold war but let's say uh, during cold war and after cold war, post cold war particularly in modern times i'm not talking about uh, pre uh, world war but in modern times you have many uh, many instances there are many which are going on now also so you can see that right sir right sir your your really it's very really it's nice to have your Sandeep, discuss sir. yes sir yes sir i think yeah subhasini ma'am is might be there into for the question ha ah, please please subhasini madam please uh, you re, you ask your question please ma'am thank you 
थैंक यू सो मच प्रमोद सर संजय जी एक्चुअली आई डोंट हैव ए क्वेश्चन आई एम जस्ट लिसनिंग बिकॉज आई एम नॉट अ स्टूडेंट ऑफ पॉलिटिकल साइंस बिफोर पुटिंग माई ऑब्जर्वेशन आई मस्ट सल्यूट यू सर द वे यू एक्सप्लेन ऑल द क्वेश्चन आई मीन it's just like i think you covered almost all the areas of academic started i mean it is a topic uh, on conflict resolution i mean uh, i mean the way you started uh, that uh, conflict uh, diplomacy is just like a tool to res- uh, resolve conflict and the role of a diplomat definitely very nicely you had given the difference between a theory and practice it is always easy to sit in the uh, audience board box and uh, i mean comment and uh, criticize the players who are playing you are just like a player who is playing on the forefront and others are uh, i mean just like uh, any other audience they are doing their role very nicely sir i was just listening to you before going uh, to the uh, i mean alio part you said very well that uh, this disturbance peace and order disturbance is uh, staying almost all the time and peace and order, order keeps on changing uh, here i can uh, remember with this theory nothing is permanent yeah everything comes and goes only thing is it is i think it is a human tendency that we always remember the disturbance the negative part though we forget our happy time pleasurable yeah. time pleasant moment but it is there it is there always but here we are discussing a higher larger bus we are not but but everything starts with the individual uh, forum every individual is having their suffering once going out of individual we are uh, facing state and uh, the way you started sir uh, you had given the example of uh, ramayana and mahabharata when i am coming to mahabharata we are we always remember lord krishna lord krishna was uh, playing the role of a controller and when i am coming to ramayana in ramayana rama as maryada purush we always uh, visualize him so these two are different kind of situation whereas uh, the global platform uh, 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 on which we are standing today is entirely a different kind of where we, i can i can think about kautilya uh, the way he is applying sam sam dand ved here because i am not going to the conflicting situation but my take is we were discussing a lot on media role of media because uh, i think uh, i think uh, in between our question one question was like uh, the role of media and the language of uh, journalism is just like i think it these are the language like a lawyer's language in the court premise i mean they have to fulfill their purpose because Uh, and trp matter these days at least today current situation all are marketizing and everybody is working for their market so accordingly they are putting there but, uh, but my question is because uh, uh, you said not only you said i think this is the this is the uh, role of media these days one media is working for one side another media is working for the again side both have working and the 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 fact which one media is putting is going in favor of one and against other in that case because you never know who is playing what kind of game inside india even as a diplomat i mean what what would be a role of a diplomat to tell the truth or to keep the media in a shadow uh-huh. because once you are telling the truth it can be misused for many reasons 
So what should be? If you are not telling the truth also, then also you are doing there. I can apply that Sam Gam Dandu Ved. Now, now let me let me let me answer your uh, this thing. It's a very good question. Uh, you know, Mahabharat had something called Narava Gunjare Ho Astasthama Hata. Yes. I think all of you know that. You know. Yes. Either the man uh, man Astasthama or the elephant Astasthama, and in between the uh, sunk the the conch goes, and Yudhishthir can't hear. Ki uh, Gunjara Astasthama Hata. So basically, what you this to hears is that the man Oswastama died, but you this to actually said both. So diplomats are actually you don't have to. It's very diff, very uh, risky to lie, tell a lie in diplomacy, because whatever you said, it will come back to you. So we don't tell lie, but so I didn't say. I truth, didn't say to tell the lie. I said no, whether no, to I don't. No, no, that's Not what I'm saying. Even, even, even to the media and all this, if you observe very keenly, he is whoever is addressing. You know, he is actually not telling you a lie because he knows exactly. If I tell a lie, it will after a few months or few days or next day, you know, it will come back to me. The same journalist will ask me saying, "You said this." So it's like framing something the way you put it, that you hint wherever there is a gray area. As I said, diplomacy deals mostly in the gray area. You know, so wherever there is a, there is no black and white answer. What you actually do is you don't tell a lie. That's out of question. You are not telling a lie, you know. And to the public, to the media, to the public diplomacy, and to the media diplomacy, and all this, what you are trying to say is you are saying what you want to convey without actually saying it. It is up to the uh, the consumer how he interprets this whole thing. So it's like saying, you know, somebody, uh, you this is saying Narava Gunjare Ho Aswasthamahata and somebody punched it in between saying Narava Aswasthamahata. So that punchers are also there in between. So what they do, you know, it's a very interesting game with the, with they play. You know, what they do is, sir, can you say this? So you said, quote unquote, let's say X, Y, Z. So what he'll do because he has to, as you said, you know, he has to mind his TRP and this and that and all this. So what he'll do, he will punch that Y in between and say he said this, and next day it becomes the headline, saying the you know ambassador to so and so or the foreign minister to, of India said this 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 this. But actually, when you see the uh, statement which he has put out in in this thing. He had said a whole sentence. He has not said a fraction of the sentence. He must have said a whole paragraph saying this is what it is. You conveniently cut this and in between say he said this and you said this. You know, so what do we do generally to clear this? Uh, out? There are certain, uh, there are two ways of, uh, again, this is a very uh, unpleasant way of doing it. But uh, you issue a statement, you know, saying this is what I said, or this is what the government is saying, or this is what, so that there is no confusion. And do it quickly, so that before it hits the breaking news, it hits your um, the other channel saying saying that this is in social. This is what the government said, you know, or you let it happen because there is a there is a bigger goal that we are, you were uh, going to serve out of this every crisis should also be seen as a as an opportunity to project what you want yeah. so if there is a miscommunication which is actually serving your bargaining um, power yeah. let it go how are you both 
<laughs> in any case, you didn't say what you said. What you wanted to say? No, that is what I said. It is. It is. You have to be. Spend my energy. You have to be really calculated in uh, whatever is is going on. So basically, as I said, you know, when we do uh, in our session, every we take knowledge from everybody. Everyone would say. the polls the people the academics the intelligentsia the uh, you know all those uh, people and then frame our own strategy how to go about it. ultimately the objective is to maximize your uh, interest you know the national interest and then use all those instruments so you reach you get the maximum out of it so i am actually as a as a person as a diplomat uh, in my personal i am actually not bothered if there are so much information so much misinformation is going on and you know if there are thousand things but out of that 999 are useless for me i am okay i will live with it you know that's their work and they they what they are doing and all this but if there is one thing which really matters to my uh, what i am trying to do i'll cash on that you know so that is so there are not so many now in today's world you know uh, media is so free you have social media you have all kinds of things so many different information misinformation counter information keeps on coming and going it's up to you how what you believe or you don't don't believe but the sankhanad is essentially narava gunjare ho asasthama hata as the ultimate how you interpret what you interpret that is your business so language game has to be they are always but one need to be very 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 focused that is what you yeah. oh, what to say you have to be, you have to be really focused you should know exactly what what you are entering into excellent i must salute you sir no, no, i mean you people are doing wonderful things we are only uh, making noise outside the thing but no, it has its own value also na no? Make yes, noise. yes. That is what every, every, every. No, no. Every profession has their own. Uh, I mean, ways and means to do. But I mean, diplomats need to. The way you said, we need to get the. I mean, uh, prepping of the. I mean, uh, cream of the uh, pack. And ultimately, you need to use wherever it is required to be used. That is your own yeah. way of. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. thanks the organizer for uh, inviting sir with such a uh, i mean at this point of hour at least is the need of the hour is kind of discussion thank you so much thank you well thank you so much subhasini ma'am for your observation your analysis on this particular session i would also like to thank dr sanjay sir for the successful moderation of the question and answer session last but not the least the chief guest for this particular session we are indeed grateful to you sir for your insightful words on this particular topic without any further delay i have a very general reminder for everyone gathered here in this meet kindly fill the feedback form which has been shared on the chat box moving ahead let me take the opportunity to invite mr prabira sethi treasurer assr and co director center for caste inclusion and social justice igpp assr sir i would like to invite you to proceed with the vote of thanks over to you prabira sir thank you milan for your tremendous cooperation and support uh, a warm and graceful uh, morning to our most valued honorable distinguished speaker of the two days international webinar his excellency sri arun kumar sahu indian foreign service and indian high commissioner at uh, tinidad and tobago good morning to all the esteemed participants chief executive igpp president asar chairman uh, chairman nivedita ma'am and all our directors of different centers of igpp founding members of the asar office bearers of cha student volunteers and everyone join the webinar it is a privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of each all in making this webinar a grand sounding success first and foremost i thank on behalf of the entire asar family and igpp extend 
special thanks to our distinguished speaker his high excellency sri arun kumar sahu indian high commissioner tinard and tobago tinidad and tobago who despite his busy schedule has found time to grace this occasion our pres our president of asar to be qualified for uh, for special thanks for his able guidance skillful leadership encouragement and his interest and continued support who left no stone unturned in making this international webinar a virtual reality we are also extremely and highly thankful uh, to our chief executive of igpp dr pramod kumar roy who is also editor in chief of the journal named asiatic society for social science research for his for his steward support vision and uh, commitment and his uh, uh, unstinted uh, relentlessly and magnanimous support in organizing this international webinar uh, also i will fail in my duty without acknowledging the significant contribution of dr charu arya director center for caste inclusion and social justice and dr nivedita giri director of gender studies for effectively and brilliantly chairing the webinar my heartful thanks to uh, all our directors of various centers of igpp and center for history and archaeology members of asar uh, editorial team and founding members of the asar i owe my special gratitude to all our interns trainees and student coordinators volunteers who have worked hard to ensure that this webinar becomes a, a memorable uh, success i would like to express my great thanks to all the distinguished distinguished invitees and participants who joined uh, this international webinar at the end it will be a great injustice for not acknowledging the evincing interest of her intern uh, milen anugraha paul political science student of maharaj aggression of university of delhi who anchored the entire event so efficiently marvelously and brilliantly that which i have hardly seen uh, once more i thank you all uh, to your patient hearing attention and cooperation thank you thank over you. to you Mil thank you praveer for your nice deliberation and thanks thank you praveer thank you This is excellent. All the best Arun. to all of you. Thank you, sir. So, so you made it a day. You made it a day. So Azhar is enter. Azhar is so grateful to you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining this particular intellectual session. Once again, a special thanks to our chief guest for the day and all the esteemed guests and the dignitaries who have joined us. I especially hope that all the scholars, research scholars, have gained something very special out of this intellectual session. And in the future, IGPP will be definitely in cooperation with ASSA. Will be hosting several intellectual will be hosting. Several. So thank you so much once again, and hope to see you in the future sessions as well. Thank you. I think Pramod sir, I will add something in the next coming. I uh, will tell something about the coming webinar, which is going to be very soon. Uh, I think in this month, by the end of this month, or uh, in the past week. Of the next month. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a very good proposal, Praveenji. Uh, so we are planning to at the end of the month we are planning to invite uh, one nationally reputed scholar. I mean a professor, Sandeep Sastri, who is a psychologist to par excellence, and to you know have his version on the you know the conflicting currents of electoral dynamics, the five state election, and the ramification and. The implication on the ensuing oh. national election 2024. So we will have a good day for that, and very shortly we will be informing you about this program. Program.